So um, it's just a good day. It's beautiful. The weekend has been beautiful, and we get to come together this morning. And we get to sing and we get to celebrate uh, this incredible love and warmth that uh, is present in our lives, even if the actual physical sun warmth is not. And uh, my name is Chris, and I want to welcome you to Encounter Church. And we really believe the next hour can be the most helpful and hopeful part of your week. Uh, we've created this experience for you. And one of the things that, that we've designed for you that's uh, meant to just kind of further serve you is the app. And it's, uh, you can download it for free, encounterchurch.com forward slash app. And inside the app, you'll find the message notes from today's uh, message. You'll find uh, abilities to connect with us or for us to connect with you. But one thing I just wanted to highlight, I don't, maybe some of you have had birthdays and you've, you've kind of downloaded the app and um, let us know. But we actually like praying for you. So one of the things that we do as a staff every single week is that we pray for people um, in the month of their birthday. And for us to be able to pray for that, we have to know it. And so if you're here and you've ever thought, man, I would love for someone just to be praying for me on my birthday. Uh, know that in the Encounter Church app, you'll see Starting Point. If you click on Starting Point or physically go by Starting Point right as you came in, you'll see a little tab that says Birthdays. And if you just put your name and your birthday. What that does is that gives us an ability for you to know, hey, we're going to be praying for you the entire month. As a staff, we come together, we're just going to be asking God to bless you in certain ways. And, um, and it's just one of the ways as a church we really believe hope can flow into your life. So um, the band's going to lead us in one more song. I'll be back up to continue our series uh, called The Game of Life. And afterwards, the band will close us out with a powerful new song that we're excited about teaching you. Thank you for being here today. Uh, we hope that you find today to be an inspiration and to give some instruction in this game of life.
I, uh, today I'm excited about this message. This is a really kind of practically geared, uh, because this idea of game of life that we've been in, uh, we introduced it at the beginning of this month, just the fact that life is a lot like a game, and that there's some parallels and there's some takeaways, and so today I want to just kind of set you off. I want to give you some really, really practical things. Uh, you're not going to be wowed, you're not going to be impressed, uh, you're just going to, I'm going to give you really two good questions that you can ask. And uh, these two questions, I don't want you to underestimate them. This is my little prior commercial um, because they're going to they're gonna be really subtle questions. But in the midst of these two questions, I think you'll find the potential to practice this potential to unlock wisdom in your life and in my life. Um, and so let me ask not the first of the questions I want to teach you, but a different question. What's the stupidest thing you've ever done? Let me ask it this way. What's the stupidest legal thing you've ever done? Okay? I, I don't know about you, but when I think about that question, there are some things that come to mind, but there's one thing specifically that pops up above them all. I was a teenager, and I had just begun learning about physics. Uh, I think the TV show Beavis and Butthead was also starting to play, so there's probably somewhat of that influence as well. If I'm being candid. Um, but I remember learning about physics and this idea of motion and objects in rest, stay at rest, objects in motion, stay at motion. And um, growing up, we had a truck. And, uh, and so we'd uh, go into the grocery store, we rode in the back of the truck, all the things that like nowadays would be kind of, you'd get you arrested if you did it to a child, but back then was just normal. Um, and so we had it was a beautiful summer day. We'd gone to the grocery store. Uh, they'd let us ride in the back of the truck, and I had the groceries. And we, we kind of lived, I uh, had a long driveway, and it was uh, primarily grass and dirt. And as we were slowing down, this, like, teenager brain of mine started kicking in. I was like, I wonder, like, because I wanted to show off. I wonder if I jumped off the back of the truck and hit the ground and started running the exact same speed as the truck, 
they would look over and like my mom would totally be impressed because she would look out the window and I'm like, hey, mom, here I am. And I would have the groceries in my mind. Like, I'm like, this is such a great idea. And I've been learning about physics. All I need to do is go the same speed as the truck and I'm okay. And so we start to slow down and we go to turn into the driveway and I'm looking at the grass and I'm like, okay, I'm pretty sure I can run this fast. I think it's safe. And so, with groceries in hand, I leapt out of the back of the truck, hit the ground, and in my mind, I was like, feet, start running, start running. So I'm starting to move my feet really fast, and then I hit the ground, and the next thing I know, my feet's coming over my head, because I'm rolling. And as I'm rolling, the grocery bags, the cans of soup and vegetables are whacking me in the head. But in the midst of this, it's like life slows down very slowly. And so it's not just like being assaulted with cans of soup hitting my head. It's the realization that I'm currently rolling alongside of a truck high enough that if I could actually go underneath it, I might die. And and so I'm having this weird moment of gratitude that it's not the tire hitting me in the head. It's just the cans hitting me in the head. And then my body finally stops. My mom is like, what? And what were you thinking? And I'm like, "I, I thought if I hit the ground running, I would have stayed up. She's like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's like, but it seems so smart up here. You ever had those kind of moments? Or it feels and seems so smart up there. And then you do it. And when you finally finish rolling along the ground and you make sure that you haven't broken anything or destroyed anything, you stand up and you ask that simple question, what in the world was I thinking? Why did I say yes to that person? Why did I go to that party? Why did I engage in that activity? Why did I marry that person? (laughs) Right? I mean, it gets significant where we start to get to these places of life and we find ourselves in a space where what was smart now seems so dumb. And today, this whole practical, these two questions I want to give you, I think the reason it has the power to be so transformative in your life is because there is one area in our life that wisdom has the greatest impact on, and it's in our decision-making. That if you and I were just to increase our decision-making abilities and started to think and to act with wiser choices in our lives, I really do think we would find our lives filled with better decisions and fewer regrets. And so today, I want to give you those two questions. Two questions that come out of a moment that's almost 3,000 years separated from where we are right now. And in the midst of the culture, we could read this story and easily miss what's going on underneath the surface. But if you dig underneath the cultural kind of origins of this story and you unpack what's going on in its context, what you find is there really are two powerful wisdom questions that you and I can ask, these wisdom disciplines that we could apply to our decision making that could have the impact to lead us to better decisions and fewer regrets. The story is found in the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, The the app that I referenced earlier Um, has it already preloaded for you in the message notes. So if you download it and click on message notes, all the passage from today is there. It's a pretty long story, so I'm going to be kind of walking through it. Um, It'll also be on the screen behind me. But I want to set the backdrop a little bit. So 1 Samuel is a book in the Old Testament. So as as Christians, uh, the Bible is our religious kind of text. And we have two distinctive volumes. We have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament. And the Old Testament are the Jewish teachings and doctrines that Christianity flow out of. And one of the books, and what's known as the historical books of the Old Testament, is the book 1 Samuel. Uh, 1 Samuel is a two-volume set. 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, it's named after the most famous prophet in Israel's history, arguably, the guy who establishes their government system. In some ways, he would be the George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson of Israel's history. He was, in some ways, the the one God used to establish the governmental structure in Israel. So he's, in some ways, Israel's kind of government's founding father. He's the one that God uses to pick the king. And then he is the one that God uses to pick David as the king. And in the sense of honoring Samuel and the fact that most of 1 Samuel is written by him, uh, those books keep his namesake. 
And those two books are primarily focused on the life of David. Um, since David is not Israel's first king, but Israel's first great king. The first king is a guy named Saul, who was picked by Samuel, but who makes a series of decisions that uh, people later regret. He's a man that all the nation thought, if he's our leader, surely everything will go all right and okay. And then Saul steps into that role of leadership and begins to make stupid decisions. And then everyone in the nation says, I regret the fact that we chose him. And then God, through Samuel, picks another man to be his successor, a guy named David, who becomes Israel's first great king. But there's this weird overlap. Saul is alive while David has been picked to be his successor. So in some ways, David's a king in waiting. He's kind of just sitting in the background, waiting for the moment that Saul passes away. And it's in this kind of backdrop and this kind of context that we jump into this story in 1 Samuel chapter 25. Samuel has just passed away. The nation is in mourning. And David is living on the, in the countryside with 600 men because he's a king in waiting while Saul is in Jerusalem reigning as the king. And it says in chapter 25, verse 2, the story that we're about to step into, that there was a certain man in Moan who had properly lived there at Carmel. He was very wealthy. He had a 1,000 goats and 3,000 sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. He was a Calebonite. I sometimes wonder if that's how people talk about Jenny and I, right? They're like, oh, she's intelligent and beautiful, and he's just a surly one, right? I mean, this is, I just love the description of this couple. It's like, man, she's got it going on. Hmm, not so much. And, and so these are the people that this story is going to unfold around. It says, while David was in the wilderness, um, because in this region, Carmel, they're surrounded by this wilderness, and this is where David and his men are there. He heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So he sent ten young men and said to him, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, Long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it is sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them, and the whole time they were at Carmel, none of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants, and they will tell you. Therefore, be favorable towards my men, since we come at a festive time. Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name, and then they waited. Now, for us, we're 3,000 years separate from this culture that's vastly different from our own. So here's the one thing you need to know. Um, when you hear sheep shearing time, you need to think party time, okay? So sheep shearing is party time. Sheep shearing, party time, right? And so this is a culture where uh, hospitality is one of the most important aspects of who they are. And if you were to travel to the Middle East today, you would still find hospitality is still a very significant part of their culture. There are um, African nations, Asian cultures as well, where hospitality is one of the more and most significant aspects of the culture. The American culture, hospitality is not the most important thing. In fact, uh, if someone shows up at your house today and knocks, your first thought is to turn off all your lights and keep your head on the ground, right? That's the very opposite of hospitality culture. In hospitality culture, someone walks up to your door and knocks, you open the door for them, you bring them in, you serve them tea or coffee, you ask them about their lives, and the next thing you know, they're staying for dinner and maybe overnight. Like, that's hospitality culture. I've been to cultures like this, and I have found myself in situations where the generosity of a person I just met is overwhelming me. They're like, oh, you need this. Oh, you need this. Let's cook the best meal we have. And cultures where it's third world and incredibly impoverished, and they're sacrificing their good things to make us feel more comfortable. It's an incredible thing. And this is their culture. To be inhospitable is this almost unfathomable idea. And so what you have in this story is a collision of two significant things. You have sheep shearing time, which is party time, and you have a hospitality culture, which means in party time, you over-prepare because you expect people are just going to show up. 
I mean, you vastly over-prepare your food and your beverages. Like, you are prepared for the party that will happen. And because of these two collision points, this is why David, living in the wilderness without food, with 600 men, says, hey, Nabal, who is very wealthy, is having sheep shearing festive time. Send, send my men and ask him if we can come. This is a very reasonable request. It would not be a reasonable request today in our world, in our time. But for this time, it is. And keep in mind, David's the king in waiting. He's not a bum. He's the one who's going to be sitting in the throne very soon. And which is why what we see happen in verse 10 is so surprising. Nabal answered David's servant. Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters this day. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to the men coming from those from who knows where? David's men turned around and went back. And when they arrived, they reported every word. Now, you don't have to read the next part. And everything that you know about this culture, what happens next? Is David brushed this off? Is this not a big deal? Like, this is an unpardonable offense in this culture. This is a very big deal, which is why we see David do what he does next. In verse 13, David said to his men, each of you strap on your sword. So they did. And David strapped his on as well. And about 400 men went up with David while 200 stayed with the supplies. David's like, are you kidding me? This is incredibly offensive. Now, there's one other aspect of culture that you need to be aware of. Again, this is not an American culture thing. But this is a Middle Eastern culture thing, and it's still Middle Eastern culture today. The Middle Eastern culture is called a culture of honor. And, and cultures of honor, which oftentimes arose from uh, kind of nomadic tribes, which had to be very protective, uh, what would happen is if you shamed someone, they had to defend their honor. And so even today in certain Middle Eastern um, villages and contexts, if you were to dishonor someone, that's an incredibly serious offense. You pull, you cut someone off in traffic here, you may get a finger pointed at you, specifically a middle one. You may hear or see some words mouthed through a mirror, but they're not ramming the car from behind, taking you off in the ditches and saying that you've dishonored them and they have to fight for their honor and their family's honor. Right? That's probably not happened to you recently. So David, who's the future king, has just been incredibly dishonored at a time where there is food available. And so David, in a culture of honor, sees this as a threat to not only him and his men, but this is a threat to his future kingdom. Because the audacity of someone to say to the future king, I, who are you? And he's like, you know who I am. Put on the sword. Let's go teach that boy who we are. And, and they go up. So this is the context of this circumstance and it's in this that i want to teach you wisdom it's in this that i want us to learn two questions and two disciplines to make our decision making better it begins with verse 14 one of the servants told abigail nabal's wife david sent messengers from the wilderness to give our master his greeting but he hurled insults at them yet these men were very good to us they did not mistreat us and the whole time we were out in the fields near them Nothing was missing. Night and day, they were a wall around us the whole time we were herding our sheep near them. Now think it over and see what you can do, because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. Now in this first moment, what we see is these servants have been standing physically at a distance. David's men show up. They talk to the master of the house, Nabal, and Nabal whose name means fool, um, literally in the Hebrew, does a foolish thing. Their physical distance to this conversation, their proximity, gives them a perspective. A perspective that they see is really dangerous. They're like, the, they, they categorize it as like doom, disaster is hanging over our entire household. All from a conversation. Their proximity, their physical distance, gives them a perspective where Nabal does not see doom or destruction looming, they do. In the early 80s, um, Intel had 
built an empire off of making memory chips for computers. In the early 80s, the personal PC was a revolution. It was growing and steam. This idea that a computer could be in every single household in America uh, was at that time this bold dream that was starting to slowly become a reality. And Intel had carved out the market on an essential component in, inside of a personal computer, and it was the, the memory. But what was happening is that Intel would invest significant amounts of money to design these memory chips, and their Japanese competitors would basically copy them. So Intel was being undercut, undercut because when they sold a chip, when they sold a memory chip, they had to sell all the R&D inside of it. They had to sell all the research, all the factories, all the mistakes they made had to be packaged inside the cost of that memory chip. The Japanese competitors didn't have to. They just copied what Intel did. And so Intel found themselves in a very precarious place. In the midst, just to kind of give you a kind of a, a frame of reference, in 1984, they bring in $198 million in profit on their memory chip. In 1985, they bring in less than $2 million. You don't have to be a CEO at Intel to recognize that's not good. And so at the time, they were dealing with this and reeling with this because they recognized Intel may not last much longer. And so while they were in discussion, there were two primary leaders at Intel at the time, Andy Grove and Gordon Moore. And for weeks, they battled, what do we do? How do we navigate? We just watched our profit drop from almost $200 million to $2 million. And Andy Grove asked this question one day when he and Gordon Moore were sitting in the office. He said, Gordon, if today I got fired from the board, the board fired me today, and they brought in my replacement tomorrow, what do you think the first thing my replacement would do? And Gordon, without hesitating, said, oh, he would get us out of the memory business and put us into the microprocessor business. See this microprocessor, this little CPU thing? Intel kind of had it as a side hustle. At the time, the only two places that Intel's microprocessor was even being used was traffic lights and bacon packaging machines. Those aren't two exactly exciting industry-leading locations to be building a product around. But yet, Gordon and Andy intuitively understood when they took a little bit of a distance and stepped back that Andy's successor would have walked in and would have gotten them out of memory because memory was going down the drain and microprocessors was where the potential actually was. And within four years, four to six years, Intel went to, no, keep in mind, less than $2 million profit. Within six years, they have a billion dollar profit out of the decision to abandon what had been their primary business and adopt this new revolutionary kind of untested business of a microprocessor. This, this day, when we think of Intel, we don't think about their memory chips. We think about the Pentium, right, the, all their commercials, all the little tiny CPUs that they put in the computers. But the reason Andy Grove and Gordon Moore was able to do that decision, to make that decision, to have insight for that decision, was essentially the same reason the servant had theirs too. They had taken a step back and had physical distance, emotional distance from the decision. It's amazing when you're in the midst of a circumstance and it's kind of breathing down your neck. It's your teenager and what they just said to you. It's your job on the line. It's your relationship pressures pressing in. It's your spouse and things that they've made. It's the finances and the weight of the debt. In those moments, in those critical moments, you can feel claustrophobic. You feel emotionally trapped. And it's really difficult to make a decision when you're nose to nose with the problem. But what the servants had was physical and emotional distance from what was going on between Nabal and his people. Just like Andy Grove when he said, I think if our replace replacements came in, they would make this decision. So why not let's fire ourselves, walk out the door, and walk back in and make the decision that someone who was actually making this decision with some distance would make. Which is why I want to give you this first question. This idea of distancing, which is what you might hear it called in psychological literature, is just labeling what you watch in this story play out. And here's a great question that, that kind of put you in a frame of mind around distancing. 
It's this simple question. What advice would I give someone I loved who was going through what I am going through? If I, if, if you had your best friend, if you had a loved one who was going through the same circumstance as you, was go, as you were presently going through, or the one that you were dealing with, how would you give them advice? What would you say to them? And that question, as simple as that question is, is really powerful because it causes you to step back from what you're going through and imagine it through the eyes of someone else. It removes you from the emotion of the moment and puts you in a frame where you care about the person and you want them to make the best decision, which is what Andy Grove does, and it's what the servants do. They realize this is not good. Nabal may feel good about what he just said, but it's a horrible decision. And because they had distance, they could see it. And this is why this question, what, what advice would you give your best friend if they were dealing with the same financial issues that you were dealing with? What advice would you give them? What advice would you give your adult child if they were walking through the job struggles you were walking through? These, this question can be used in a lot of different areas. I, I ask this question a lot. Those moments where um, in the midst of finishing up my doctorate right now and feeling the weight and the time of being away from my family, there are moments where I just want to, honestly, I just want to like close the books and walk away because I just feel so overwhelmed by it. And even yesterday, sitting in a coffee shop, writing, and not being at home, I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, what advice would I give someone, a friend of mine, another pastor friend of mine, what advice would I, would I give to him in this moment? And I would say, man, don't give up. You're so close. And, and it's worth this little bit of pain for a lifetime of this thing that you've always dreamed of having. Keep pressing through. And that, just that, Give me a little bit of encouragement to keep writing. And this idea of distancing is what we see witnessed with these servants when they go to Abigail. But then Abigail hears it, and she demonstrates something that's helpful too. Abigail, um, they come to her, and they're like, look, things are falling apart. We're really in trouble. And it says in verse 18 that Abigail acted quickly. She hears what they say. And so she took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five seas of roasted grain, a hundred cakes of raisin, two hundred cakes of pressed figs, and loaded them all on a donkey. So remember how I told it's party time, it's festive time, they overproduce food on purpose? This is evidence of that. This stuff is already sitting on the shelves waiting to be grabbed. Abigail knows there's an excess of food. She walks and she grabs it, she loads it up on a donkey, and then she sets out. And it says in verse 23, When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. So she's got this donkey full of food, and she finally sees David, who's on his way, remember, with a sword, with 400 men, with a sword, and they're all coming to crush what they see as a rebellious house and a future kingdom of their king. And verse 27, she starts to talk to him. And at verse 27, I want to pick up with what she's saying. She says, and let this gift, pointing to the donkey behind her, which your servant has brought to my Lord, be given to the men who followed you. She's like, I have enough food for all of your men. And then she says, verse 28, please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for you, my Lord, because you fight the Lord's battles. And no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as the pocket of a sling. Notice the pocket of a sling there. She's doing this subtle reference. She's got some insight and she understands what's going on. This is David, David who killed Goliath. And how did he kill Goliath when he was a teenager? He did it with a sling. Like, this is, this is the future king, the powerful warrior, this mighty leader who's known throughout the land for killing tens of thousands of enemies when they come up against Israel. Like, she understands as she's sitting, bowing to him, that this is a powerful, powerful man. And she's like, please forgive us. You see, what Abigail has is that Abigail doesn't just see the decision she practices what I, what I call downstreaming. She sees what happens as a result of the decision. She recognizes that while her husband has just had an interaction with men from the future king, 
She sees a man who has killed tens of thousands. She sees a man who, with a stone and a sling, took down enemy, Israel's greatest enemy, Goliath. She recognizes not just the decision Nabal has made, but she's recognized the downstream effect of that decision. Because when you choose a choice, you choose a consequence. And she sees it. When we were at Disney earlier this year, it was our last night, and we wanted to see the fireworks show. And so my wife was like, hey, we need to get there early because at Disney World, this grand square leading up to Cinderella's castle, over 10,000 people will, will gather in that square for the fireworks show. So we get there 90 minutes early. We go up towards the very front. We sit down on the asphalt. We're grabbing dinner. We're eating. And because this is our last night, and it's really special, and we want to experience it. And while we're sitting there, about 30 minutes uh, we're finished with our dinner. We're still sitting down. People are starting to show up. The, this whole vast area is starting to kind of get filled with people. And about 30 minutes before the show, there is a couple that walks out. And they're about as far from me to that third row. And we're sitting down. Thousands of us are sitting down. And they walk up and they stand up right there and blocking our view. And my wife is like, Chris. I'm like, Jenny. There is no way. They will sit down. Don't worry. They're just stretching their legs. They're probably like me. At this point, my left butt cheek was completely numb. I was like, they, they're smarter than me. They realize they should just probably be standing. They will sit down. Do not worry. Fifteen minutes goes by. Chris, they're still standing. I'm telling you, girl, trust me. I, I know they're not going to stand up. You see thou, all these thousands. At this point, it's like 10,000 people. If they keep standing... We will have a riot at the happiest place on earth. Like no one would do this. This is Disney World. And then you hear, two minutes, two minutes before the show starts. Ladies and gentlemen, two minutes. She's like, Chris? I'm like, babe, they're going to sit down. Like nobody would stand up when all these people are sitting there. And then the lights go dim. And the show starts. And they're still standing. And all of a sudden you hear, sit down! And it's like the happiest place on earth is no longer the happiest place. It's like this is how Law and Order episodes start, right? And and it's kind of just playing out. And I was like, look at my wife. And I'm like, I told you. (laughs) The woman turns around, looks at the crowd of thousands of people who are booing her, and does this. And then turns back. And instantly this cascading wave of humanity springs up to their feet. And I'm not exaggerating when I say 10,000 people stand up as a reaction to this woman's choice to keep standing. I remember pulling out my phone and taking a picture of that woman, not to find her later, but because I wanted to forever cement this in my mind as what happens when you make a decision. Because I was visually watching the power of decision making and the cascading downstream effect of our choice. That 10,000 people paid for this woman's decision. And I think Abigail had this insight that there is always a downstream to the decisions that you and I make. There are always people who pay for the choices that you and I make. That those moments of selfishness and self-centeredness where we choose to do one thing or spend money on something that our family can't afford, right? whatever it happens to be, those moments, have downstream effects. They ripple. They cascade. And Abigail knew this, which is why she shows up and stops David from getting there. And so here's another question that helps you, I think, kind of jump out and, and see the downstream effect, and it's this. In light of where I would like to be, what is the wisest choice for me? kind of a big one, in light of where I would like to be. So think about the future me. Like, where's the future me want to go? If the future me wants to be healthy, then I need to probably push away the second plate at the table. I recognize that. If the future of me wants to have a doctor on the front of his name, then he probably should keep writing. If the future me wants to have a healthy marriage that is built on clear communication, it means that in this moment I don't run and flee from the conflict, I stay and I talk. In light of where I would like to be, what is the wisest choice for me? In this present moment, in my finances, in my marriage, in my parenting, in my professional life, in my personal life, in my health, 
what is the wisest choice for me in light of where I want to be? And that that frame of reference helps us. That question helps to unlock for us an insight. And in the midst of asking ourselves those, those two questions, I think we start to move ourselves towards a life of wisdom. Because the reality is, I believe our life is an accumulation of the actions and the choices that we make. They are ultimately what end up defining us. I was at a meeting this week. I was traveling and was working and writing. And I'm sitting 1,500 miles from where we are right now. And I'm on a balcony of a hotel um, reading a book for this research project I'm doing. And I look up and I happen to see these birds. I have a picture of them. And um, these birds that I saw are called starlings. Now, starlings are known for this amazing ability they have to swarm and this like almost mesmerizing sweeping motion that they do but most of us don't know the history of starlings in america you see in 1890 there was a new yorker named eugene shefflin who loved shakespeare and in henry the sixth there is a reference to starlings that eugene so adored that living in New York, he had this thought, I would love to be able to look out the window of New York and see starlings, the way Shakespeare saw starlings. But the problem was, is that starlings aren't native to America. They don't live here. They only live in England, well, in Europe. And so he has this idea. He gets a hundred starlings from Europe, and he goes out to Central Park, and he releases them. In 1890. And those 100 starlings begin to thrive here. There's no natural predators to starlings on the American continents. And so what happens is they start to multiply and they spread at an astonishing rate. They go all the way over to Alaska. They stretch all the way down to Mexico. And in fact, this week, 1,500 miles from where the starlings were released, I see them. It's estimated that today there are almost 200 million starlings in the American continent. About 130 years after the first 100, because all of those starlings that filled the skies of our nation come from those 100 starlings released at Central Park in 1890. It's incredible. And the reason these birds are so devastating is that the starlings as beautiful and as mesmerizing as their kind of sweeping motion is, at the end of the day, these enormous flocks have crashed airplanes and killed people. They sweep through and devastate crops. They have eradicated food supplies in areas that have taken out native species. And to top it off, their bird droppings, which these enormous flocks leave behind, are riddled with E. coli and salmonella. These birds have been responsible for deaths, and they currently are estimated their financial impact on agriculture alone is millions of dollars a year in lost revenue because of the crops that they kill. All because one man in 1890 releases 100 birds in Central Park. And what's powerful about that story is when I was reading it, I realized that this captures for me that perspective that being a pastor brings. Because I'm a pastor, there's moments where I'm in the midst of the same day, I'm celebrating the birth of someone and I'm watching a burial of someone. That in the course of one day, I can go the full gamut of human experience. And because I'm able to do that, there's a perspective that this story brings out that I see the impact of lives and the choices. That at the end of the day, we make choices and then our choices make us. And that our lives really are, when we get to the end of our lives, they're an accumulation of action. And that what we see in this story is a wisdom of distancing that gave, gave these people an ability to realize that with a little bit of distance, this was not the wise choice Nabal had made. And with an ability of looking downstream, they saw how his choice was going to have a devastating downstream effect. And because of that wisdom, they were able to stop and avert a disaster. And, and for some of us in this room... I'm probably not over-exaggerating, and for some of us who will hear this message or join us online, 
the, our lives are teetering on the edge of disaster, not because of things people have done to us, but because of the choices and the decisions that we're actively making in our life. And that the difference between where your marriage is now and where your marriage could be, the difference between your finances now and where your finances could be, the difference in how you're parenting, how your job, all those different factors in your life, the difference could weigh on one decision or a handful of decisions that you make. And this is why I think of all the areas, wisdom's greatest impact to us is in this realm of decision making. And so as we head out today, What, in light of where you would like to be, is those best decisions for me? And then in the midst of the circumstances that we find ourselves, how and what advice would we give to those that we care about if they were going through the same thing we are too? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this story. Thank you for the insight and the wisdom that it brings. I pray for wisdom to mark our lives. Pray for insight discernment that we would be people who see downstream and who practice distancing and that we would begin to make choices that lead to better decisions and fewer regrets and that in every and all things that our lives would honor you and it's in your name jesus that i pray amen so today we want to teach you a new song and so we wrap up every single week at encounter um, with a song. And it just gives us space uh, for a couple different things. One is that we really believe uh, this one hour can be the most helpful, hopeful part of your week. And so in order to do that, we put in those message notes two questions. Uh, what did I hear today and what, what am I going to do with it? And so we, we, we close with a song so that there's uh, some freedom. Because I don't know about you, but the moment I walk out of here, there's something else to do. There's somewhere else to go. There's things looming in my life. And so to have just three to five minutes where you can kind of take a step back and reflect and think and process to kind of get some clarity around your life is really helpful. It's also a space that we use to carve out um, for you maybe to engage with the app, with the connection card or prayer request or uh, maybe to sign up to serve. There's a lot of different areas. And so we recognize that maybe God's kind of stirring inside of you and there's questions you have about faith or there's a desire you have to get connected here. And we, we want to give you time to be able to do that too, even through the app. But we also carve it out for those who call Encounter Church home to practice our generosity because your generosity um, allows us to do incredible things, not just here in this community, but around the world. And we're able to do those things because of the generosity of our people. And so we carve this time out for us to practice our generosity. But today, here's what I want to press into just a little bit. I think it's really helpful. We want to teach you a new song. Because the challenge I felt when I was preparing this message is that this is a great message if you've got a a decision that's looming in your life. But what do you do if your life is already filled with decisions and there is no time machine? Like, that's great. I really wish I had known that two years ago. And that the beauty of the Christian faith, the the majesty of Easter, is that Jesus went to the cross and that in his life and his death, the, the weight of the choices and the decisions that we've made in our lives that have made us, that when he came back from the dead, his power and his resurrection was making a declaration that what we have done and who we have been does not have to shape forever who we are becoming. That the choices that you and I have made do not have to define us if we are willing to put our trust in the choice that he made on the cross and the choice that he made to come back from the dead, that you and I can be redefined by what he has done, by what he has decided. And that so no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've come from, no matter what in the midst you find yourself, it's okay because he has risen from the grave. And that there is a power and there is a majesty and there's a hope for those who put their trust in that. And so for those who are maybe sitting in this room who are joining online who are like, man, I wish I had known these things before, that there's good news. That that does not have to define you. It does not have to mark your life permanently. And that's what this song's about. So we want to kind of, kind of leave today with this powerful declaration. 
It's a song called Tremble. And it just takes the name of Jesus and it, it fleshes out a little bit of this idea of Easter because he's alive. It means our decisions no longer have to rule our lives. That because he is alive, because he came back from the grave, our decisions don't have to send us to the grave. And so this song is that his name, that, that at his power, that his voice, that there is something about him that when we lean on him and we confess to him and we reveal to him what we, he already knows, God, I've made these mistakes, I've made these choices, I've made these decisions. I want to see my life different, that he steps in. And with his power and his majesty, things start to tremble and shake. So I invite you to stand. Our band's going to teach you this song. And, uh, and then right at the end, we'll come up and dismiss you. But thanks for being at Encounter Church today. Let's lean in. Let's learn this song and find the hope that it contains. lungs to
Thanks so much for joining us here at Encounter Church. We hope you found today's message to be both hopeful and helpful to you. If you have questions about who we are, including opportunities to serve or upcoming groups that you can be involved in, please stop by Starting Point on your way out. We look forward to seeing you next week as we continue the series. Until then, enjoy your Sunday, enjoy your week. Thank you.